It is time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up, the Zika virus has been linked to birth defects in Latin America, but scientists say more research needs to be done to confirm a connection. John looks at what expectant mothers need to know about the virus. Oh, this is baby B up here. 30-year-old Jessica Reiner is expecting twins in April. She's getting a blood test for the Zika virus, something she had never heard of a month ago. The Zika virus definitely adds an element of anxiety. This being my first pregnancy, I feel very anxious about a lot of things. Last month, she and her husband, Drew, took a vacation to Puerto Rico, not knowing it had just been added to a CDC list of places with Zika transmission. Then a friend sent her this text message. Jess, have you heard about Zika? I don't want to scare you, but you should avoid mosquitoes. In Brazil, Zika virus has been linked with microcephaly, babies being born with an abnormally small head and brain. Those who survive often have lifelong neurological problems. Dr. Stacy Ehrenberg is a high-risk pregnancy expert at University Hospital's Case Medical Center in Cleveland. She says some of her patients are panicked. I think a lot of patients are very concerned that they could contract Zika virus here in the United States. We don't have any patients here in the continental United States who have actually contracted the virus here. Zika virus remains in the blood of an infected person for an average of about a week. The CDC says, based on current evidence, a previous Zika infection does not pose a risk of birth defect for a future pregnancy. And men who live in or have traveled to a country with a Zika outbreak should abstain from sex or use condoms during sex with pregnant women. Is there a chance that these mosquitoes could come to the United States? I think that's, that's what so many people are fearing. Well, it's that the virus will come to the, the United States. The mosquitoes are already here. The 80s Egypti mosquitoes that carry or can carry Zika are in the South. They're in Florida, they're in Texas, they're in Hawaii, in the panhandle. So I think, and a lot of experts, most experts actually I've spoken to think, it's almost inevitable that the Zika virus will come to a mosquito in, in the United States, probably in the South. And that's why it's so important that we have uh, control efforts to eradicate the mosquito breeding grounds now, right now. Don't wait till the first case and everybody runs around excited. Do it now so we can prevent it. New sleep research from the CDC may not surprise some of our yawning viewers this morning. A report finds more than one-third of American adults are not getting enough sleep on a regular basis. The CDC recommends adults get seven hours of sleep each night. Holly, who's, who are the most sleep-deprived among us? Right. Well, Anthony, one of the greatest strengths of this survey was that so many people were involved, right? More than 400,000 across the U.S. So you could start to really identify patterns and groups that were at the highest risk risk of not getting enough sleep. Uh, geography mattered, state by state. So the state that gets the least sleep are people in Hawaii, uh, whereas people in South Dakota get the most sleep. About 72% of people in that state get the requisite seven hours. Interestingly, ethnicity and race were also correlated with how much sleep you get, uh, whereas two-thirds of people who are white or Hispanic get a seven hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. Just half of people who were black, non-Hispanic, uh, get that requisite amount. I'm shocked Hawaii, though. I would think of, I mean, of all the wonderful <laughs> things, you'd think people there are sleeping really well. Are there any other big factors that lead to the deficit? Sure, well, economics, education, and even marital status, we could see oh. links and patterns among how much you sleep. So uh, people who are employed, who have a higher education level, college or above, and are married, sleep more than people who are unemployed, uh, less educated, or are divorced, separated, or widowed. Now, these are simply associations and patterns. We can't say that uh, if you are unemployed, that makes you sleep less, or if you sleep less, that raises your risks of being unemployed. But I think from a big public health perspective, all of these things are important. It helps health care providers identify who really might need intervention most. It can help employers identify people at risk. Um, and just it can help with public policy, education, and really focusing people on the amount of sleep we need. How are we affected by a lack of sleep, John? Well, we used to think you didn't get a good night's sleep, you were tired. Yep. That was it. Yep. You had to recharge your batteries. And now we're realizing that all these other things happen when we're sleeping. Uh, we're repairing our immune system. You don't get enough sleep, you have increased infections, increased numbers of colds. We're also resetting the hormones that help regulate our appetite. 
So if you don't get enough sleep, you actually can have an increased risk of obesity. There's an increased risk of hypertension, diabetes, heart attack, stroke. There are a lot of things that are happening when you sleep. Well, what do you tell your patients who are having trouble sleeping then? Right. Well, well, energy fatigue and hence uh, getting good sleep is really a big focus of, of both my research and my practice. Uh, the single most important thing you can do is to establish sleep hygiene. That's a group of habits that you uh, use every time you go to bed. Uh, some of the most important, go to bed and wake up at the same time every day. Even on weekends, try not to, to make the difference more than an hour. That helps to keep your circadian cycles regular. Uh, create a, what we call a sleep sanctuary. Your room should be cool, about 67 degrees, dark, quiet, uh, minimal disturbances if you can. And perhaps most importantly, especially in today's day and age, turn off all of your electronic devices, anything that has a light. That means cell phones, computers, and even the TV set. We're starting to understand that light from those devices um, can affect the melatonin levels. It can affect melatonin secretion from the brain, slow it down, and that makes it harder for us to fall asleep. So turn the devices off, and of course, keep them off overnight. As too many people are awakened up are, are wakened uh, overnight by their cell phones. Well, finally from us this morning, another new study suggests a new key to a longer life. This one might even be fun. The study showed membership in a social group after retirement, like a book club or a church group, is linked to a longer lifespan. Researchers say the health benefits are similar to regular exercise. I am not surprised by this. Dan Buettner, um, identified what he called blue zones, places around the world where people lived longer, especially yeah. long. And one of the things they all had in common was community, right. was a sense of, of belonging. And we know that it can decrease the risk of dementia, just being in contact with other people. Yeah. It's so important in ways that we don't understand that you can't measure scientifically. Yeah, you know, and one of the things, we, we there are a lot of research shows somehow retirement can be bad for your health. Yes. Um, and we often don't think of what the workplace place provides, which is really a social, social. environment as well. Um, so if you're not at work, to create a social environment outside of work can have health benefits. And as we always say, call your parents. <laughs> right. So sleep more, so join a club, call, call your, parents. your parents. Dr. John LeBouc, Dr. Holly Phillips, thank you so much.